Hello everyone! Congratulations to France for winning the FIFA 2018 World Cup and while that saga is over, uh, our Bobby Fischer saga is only beginning. Uh, this is the first video in the series, uh, the Bobby Fischer story. Uh, we're not gonna do a series on, on uh, Bobby's entire life as that would take us uh, too, too, much, uh, too much time. Uh, rather, we're just gonna cover, for this series, uh, we're just gonna cover the 1970 uh, Palma de Mallorca uh, interzonal tournament, the 1971 candidates matches, and the 1972 uh, World Chess Championship match against Boris Pasky. And uh, I have already covered some uh, of the games uh, that we will be encountering in this series, so when we get to that part I will just refer you to the link uh, to the video I have already created maybe, maybe a year ago, but uh, you know, the game is still the, the same. So uh, I don't think uh, I'll be uh, like making a new video uh, for a game I already covered, uh, unless like it's a really special case for some reason. Uh, but in general, uh, I will not be doing that. So, uh, as this is the first video in the series, we should discuss uh, how Bobby even came here in Palma de Mallorca to play this uh, interzonal tournament. And uh, what's, uh, what was the World Chess Championship cycle like in those days? Uh, well, you had the zonal tournaments. So, for example, uh, if you were from the United States, like Bobby Fischer was, uh, you had to play the zonal tournament to qualify for the interzonal tournament. Uh, in this uh, championship cycle, uh, the zonal tournament was the 19th 1969 uh, US Championship and uh, only the top three, uh, three contenders of the 1969 US Championship were able to qualify uh, for the 1970 uh, Palma de Mallorca tournament which was the interzonal tournament uh, but unfortunately uh, for Bobby and uh, for the United States Bobby did not play in the 1969 uh, United States Championship here are the final standings of the 1969 US Championship so as you can see uh, tournament was won by Samuel Roshevsky, uh, followed by Edison, Benko, uh, and in fourth place, uh, fourth place you have Lombardi. So uh, three of the top contenders, uh, Roshevsky, Edison, and Benko, uh, were uh, uh, were able to qualify uh, for this tournament that we are now covering, the 1970 uh, Palma de Mallorca tournament. And if some of them couldn't make it, then Lombardi would uh, would step in. Uh, but as uh, the United States didn't really think that uh, any of them had a chance of uh, taking the World Chess Championship title uh, away from the Soviets, they really, really, really wanted Bobby to play. Uh, now, how did Bobby get here if he didn't even play the tournament that was meant to be a qualifier for this interzonal tournament? Uh, well, uh, the reason Bobby decided, uh, even though Bobby won the last uh, eight uh, United States championships, uh, he... Uh, sometimes he would lose a game or sometimes he would lose uh, two games uh, in the United States Championship uh, and then he thought uh, 11 rounds uh, in a single championship isn't enough. There should be 22 rounds. So even if you have a mistake uh, or if you have a bad game or you know if, you're, if, if your form drops or something, uh, you will still be able to catch up and the strongest player will definitely uh, win the tournament after 22 rounds. Uh, but as Bobby's uh, conditions weren't met, uh, they said that you know not everyone is a professional champion player you know not everyone can take uh, a whole month of just to play one chess tournament uh, you know people have other things to do uh, Bobby decided that he will not play this tournament even though it's a zonal tournament uh, you know required to qualify for the interzonal tournament now you'll remember uh, as I already covered the series on the 1959 candidates tournament which Bobby did play you know he had a couple of very nice games uh, but he didn't finish all that great but in the 1962 uh, Bobby did crush the uh, the interzonal tournament, and then everyone thought that okay, he is he is in top form. Uh, he will definitely crush the 1962 candidates tournament, but not really. Everyone thought it would be Bobby who would uh, you know end Mikhail Botvinnik's long reign, but in the end, Bobby barely broke even in that tournament. Uh, then he you know uh, asked for some special uh, special terms regarding the 1965 candidates tournament, uh, which the organizers uh, did uh, agree upon, uh, but then Bobby simply decided not to play in the 1965 Candidates Tournament. Then we had uh, the 1967 Interzonal Tournament, which Bobby started playing, and he was uh, leading the tournament, uh, but then he had a dispute uh, regarding some schedules uh, uh, of the games uh, with the organizers, and then he decided uh, to leave the tournament while, uh, while being in the lead. 
So he already missed uh, up on a lot of chances. And uh, here it's 1970, uh, another zonal tournament, uh, which he did not take part in. And uh, yet here he is in the interzonal tournament of uh, Palma de Mallorca in 1970. So what's the story? Uh, here, as we've said, uh, Reshevsky, Addison and Benko uh, uh, qualified for the interzonal tournament. Uh, but Benko decided to step down so Bobby Fischer could uh, take his place in this interzonal tournament. But as Lombardi uh, was uh, like a substitute, if any, Reshevsky, uh, Addison or Benko could couldn't make it, uh, then Lombardi would step in, uh, but as uh, Benko gave up his uh, spot to Bobby Fischer, Lombardi said, yeah, okay, I'm not uh, taking uh, your spot, Bobby can play, uh, because they all agreed Bobby was the strongest player in the world at uh, that time, and that he had the most uh, chances to take away the title from the Soviets, and he was the highest rated player in the world. So that's how Bobby came here, and, uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, you know, uh, said, okay, uh, Benko was forced to do it, uh, they paid Benko a lot of money to give up his spot for Bobby Fischer, but Benko said no, uh, you know, the United States, he said the United States did so much for me, uh, you know, I did it uh, of my own free will, you know, completely voluntarily, and no one forced me into it. So that's how Bobby uh, got his place in the 1970 Palma de Mallorca Interzonal Tournament, uh, and this is a game from round one. He faces a uh, German international master. Uh, okay, he was international master in 1970, 1971. Uh, he already got his grandmaster title, but uh, definitely a strong player, uh, as you'll see from this game and from uh, the results he made in this tournament. And uh, uh, as you know, okay, uh, we're going to check out uh, who who played in this tournament, who all the participants were, and, you know, how everyone did. And uh, I don't have a lot of photos from this tournament. Uh, here I found this very nice photo of Bobby Fischer uh, by Dragoslav Andrich, who was taken in the Palma de Mallorca. I think this is actually uh, a photo from round one, but I could be mistaking. There, there aren't uh, all that many photos from the 1970 Palma de Mallorca tournament. Uh, if any of you have like a, a secret stash of the 1970 Palma de Mallorca photos, uh, you know, do share a link in the comments so we can all enjoy them and I will add them, you know, in, in my future videos for this series. Uh, if not, uh, we're just going to have to enjoy the ones we have. So, uh, round one, uh, 1970 uh, Palma de Mallorca inter Interzonal Tournament, uh, the first game of the series. Let's check it out. Fischer has the white pieces and he opens the game with e4. Uh, we have c6, d3, d5, and knight to d2. The rare variation of the Karo Khan defense. So, I'm not going with the d4, the standard idea, but rather d3 and keeping the position closed. And I will add uh, a couple of more useful links in the description below uh, to this entire series. So, whenever you're interested or you want to check it out, uh, you know, there will be a lot. A, a lot of additional information because it, I could really talk about it uh, for a long time. You know, uh, Bobby's uh, disputes with the, with the organizers, the, the letters Bobby sent to the organizers, uh, the letters the organizers sent back to Bobby, uh, his replies to them, and you know, a, a lot of very interesting stuff that would really uh, make this video simply too long and all of the other videos in this series. Uh, but uh, as usual, all of the additional uh, content will be in the description below, so feel feel free to check it out. Uh, we have g6 here, uh, knight g to f3, bishop to g7, fianchettoing the bishop, uh, g3, Bobby prepares to fianchetto his light square bishop as well, e5 now, uh, bishop to g2, knight to e7, Bobby castles, uh, we have castles also, uh, rook to e1, and here uh, completely now closing it, d4. Uh, Bobby starts a4, not allowing black to expand uh, on the queen side with the b5. Uh, we have c5 now, and now comes knight to c4. So, okay, uh, a4, preventing black from kicking this knight away with b5. Also, now there is a double attack towards the e5 pawn, you have to defend it. Uh, knight b to c6, nicely uh, developing a piece while defending the e5 pawn. Uh, we have c3, challenging black's very strong center. Uh, bishop to e6, and now comes pawn captures on d4. Uh, Hubner plays uh, bishop captures on c4. Uh, we have d captures on c4, and now uh, again e captures on d4. Uh, e5 now by Bobby. Uh, queen to d7, and now comes h4. So, pretty much uh, an equal position. Uh, black could be a bit better here as white did expand uh, both on the queen side and on the king side and uh, he's not, his pieces uh, aren't really all that great, uh, greatly developed just yet. Uh, we have d3. Uh, 
it's a very nice pass pawn so black uh, black pushes it uh, to d3 and also perhaps in the future creates a nice uh, square on d4 for his knight uh, we have bishop to d2 uh, preparing to develop the bishop on c3 uh, rook a to d8 and now comes bishop to c3 now uh, with a triple uh, defense of the e5 pawn uh, knight to b4. Now that the pawn is on uh, d3, uh, Hubner decides that he will now play knight to b4, uh, either uh, forcing black, uh, forcing Bobby to give up his bishop pair, or he has to deal with this knight to c2 move somehow. Uh, here, Bobby plays knight to d4. A very nice idea. Uh, the knight from d4 is now guarding the c2 square, so knight, knight to c2 is not possible. Uh, and of course, if you capture it, then bishop captures on b4 will be very nice for Fisher. Now Hubner will have uh, two two double d pawns and of course uh, one will one will quickly fall uh, so what do you do here uh, uh, the best move for well for black would, would be knight uh, knight e to c6 simply getting this knight into the, into the game and now either threatening knight captures here or force uh, force fisher to capture on c6 uh, rather here rook f to e8 was played and this g uh, gave fisher a, a very nice tempo with uh, pawn to e6 now uh, Black has to react to this. We have pawn captures. Now comes knight captures on e6, attacking the rook on d8. Uh, first, the bishop captures on c3, uh, attacking Bobby's rook on e1. We have b captures on c3, and now comes knight to c2, as the knight is no longer on d4, guarding the c2 square. Uh, knight captures on d8 by Bobby. Uh, we have rook captures on e8, and now simply uh, queen to d2. Both rooks are under attack. You can't save them both, so uh, not, not really... Uh, you know, you can't save both of the rooks. Uh, knight captures on a1, rook captures on a1, and now king to g7. So if you look at the position now, still it's about equal, but now uh, because uh, black didn't play that knight to c6 move, Bobby really now uh, does have the upper hand in this position. It's a better position, the rook will be uh, slightly more active, and although black has a very dangerous past d3 pawn, uh, it's not all that easy to, to take advantage of this. Uh, we have rook to e1 now. Uh, moving the rook from the defense of the a4 pawn, but queen captures on a4 is impossible for the moment because rook to e1 comes with a tempo on the knight. Uh, so knight to g8, getting the knight back, now queen captures on a4 is definitely a threat. Uh, but Fisher has a different idea. Bishop to d5. Now the rook and queen are no longer guarding the past d3 pawn and Fisher simply gives up his a4 pawn for the d3 pawn. Uh, queen captures on a4, Fisher plays. Queen captures on d3, and now comes rook to e8. Uh, it's, a, it's an idea. I mean, uh, the b7 pawn is under attack, but it's very hard to do something about this. If you play something like b6, uh, then rook to e6 will be very active for Bobby. Uh, after queen comes to d7, uh, then queen comes to e2, uh, simply controlling this knight here. If the knight ever moves, rook to e7 is coming. Uh, if black tries king h8 to get out of the way, or Fisher would simply improve, let's say queen e3, simply controlling uh, the squares uh, of this knight, and slowly but surely white will white will keep pushing. Uh, so instead, here Hubner goes for an active idea, rook to e8. He forces a trade of rooks. Uh, rook captures on e8, we have queen captures on e8, now the queen comes back into the game, and now bishop captures on b7. So Fisher is up a pawn here, uh, but he himself has a double C pawn. So it's not uh, it's not really like a real pawn, uh, but you know, but, but it, it is a pawn up. Uh, knight to f6. Hubner reactivates the knight. Uh, we have queen to d6, uh, and now comes queen to d7, offering a trade of queens. Queen to a6. Now attacking the a7 pawn. Uh, we have queen to f7, and now comes queen captures on a7. Uh, this is a move that perhaps came too quickly for Bobby. Uh, here Bobby had an opportunity to play bishop back to f3. Bishop back to f3 uh, because now uh, black's idea while the bishop is still there. Black's idea is to play knight to e4, especially if queen captures on a7, and then open up an attack towards this f2 pawn, uh, which was played in the game. But with bishop to f3, this bishop is controlling the knight very nicely. And uh, let's say after queen to d7, black doesn't have all that many active moves. Uh, king to g2, uh, simply you know, improving the position of the king. And after the queen moves, uh, let's say queen to c5, simply improving the position for white. Uh, but okay, after queen to f7, queen captures on a7 was played, and this allows Hubner this, uh, well, pretty much an instant draw uh, move. And that is knight to e4. It's the strongest move, but uh, it uh, gives, gives nothing but a draw. 
Uh, here, uh, the f2 pawn is under attack. You cannot capture the knight because your queen would be hanging. Uh, so Fisher played the only move. Uh, we have f3. Uh, if you tried something like uh, queen captures on c4, that of course, uh, instead of this knight to e4, if you tried queen captures on c4, then of course you lose the queen after bishop to d5. Uh, but okay, after queen to a7, knight to e4 was played, the f2 pawn is under attack. Uh, f3, the only move by Fisher, and now comes knight to d6. And now it uh, becomes obvious uh, that Fisher's bishop on b7 uh, is a goner. So there's nothing to do here, uh, Fisher plays uh, queen captures on c5, we have knight captures attacking the queen, and now queen to d4. So uh, Hübner is now up a knight, but Fisher is up three pawns. So uh, if if the knight and queen could somehow, uh, somehow approach the white king, and then perhaps uh, Fisher would be in trouble, but it will be very hard. Uh, if, you know, uh, the, if the queen blocks, uh, then the queen can also check on d7, pick up the knight, or the queen would have to block with queen to, queen back to f7. So there's really not all that much to do here. Uh, Hubner tried king g8, uh, we have king to f2, and now comes queen e7, and now uh, queen to d5 check. Again, you cannot uh, block with the queen, white will simply move, so king to f8, now comes h5. Uh, Fisher wants to completely bust those uh, bust, bust the pawn structure, uh, so he can simply continue checking the black king. Uh, we have g captures on h5, now comes queen captures on h5, uh, and the knight to c5. Hubner now uh, tries to activate the knight, but Fisher simply plays queen to d5. Uh, we have king to g7, and now queen to d4 uh, with check. Again, you can't block with the queen because you lose the knight on c5, king moves, now comes queen d5 check, again, the idea is the same. Uh, we have king moves, now comes queen checks, king moves, and now uh, queen to d5. Uh, you could try something like uh, knight to d5, but uh, again, it doesn't help you all that much. Uh, now the knight is pinned, the white can simply push f4, f5, and uh, in the end, uh, regardless of your extra piece, your king is wide open and the white will always be able to check you. So, yeah, uh, after this uh, queen to d5 check, once again, uh, they agree to a draw, and uh, Bobby's uh, first game uh, in this series, in this Palma de Mallorca Interzonal Tournament, ended in a draw. So, yeah, uh, and like I said, uh, I did prepare here, our, uh, the, these are the final standings after the Palma de Mallorca Interzonal Tournament of 1970. Uh, as you all know, Fisher did win this tournament, so that's not really a surprise to all of you, but I just wanted to show you all of the players. So 24 players participated here, uh, and uh, as you can see, Fisher won it with 18 and a half out of 23. 15 wins, 1 loss, and 7 draws. So the, some of the players, uh, as you see, Bobby Fisher uh, in first place, then Ben Larson, Effin Geller, uh, Robert Hubner, his opponent uh, from this game, international master Robert Hubner, f with uh, 15 out of 23. Same as Geller and Larson, uh, also qualified for the 1971 candidate matches. Uh, then we have Mark Taimanov, Wolfgang Ullmann, then Portish, Smyslov, Polugaevsky, Gligoric, uh, Pano, Meking, uh, Hort, Ivkov, Sutles, uh, Minich, Reshevsky, Matulovic, uh, Addison, uh, Filip, uh, Naranya, uh, Uyutmen, uh, Rubinetti, and Zerquera. So uh, those were the 24 players that participated in the 1970 Palma de Mallorca International uh, Interzonal Tournament. Uh, first uh, video of of this series. I do hope you enjoyed it, and uh, you know the, the little prelude to this uh, whole story. Uh, and like I said, uh, a lot of additional information will be in the description below. A lot of links for you to check out. You know, don't don't be shy to do it. And uh, like I said, if you have some sort of a secret stash of the 1970 uh, Palma de Mallorca interzonal uh, tournament photos, uh, do share so we can all enjoy them. So yeah, uh, I would like to thank J James Norwood for a contribution to my channel. Thank you a lot. I really appreciate it. Uh, as usual, you can check two of my previous videos here. Thank you all for watching, and uh, I will see you soon with uh, game two uh, of this of this wonderful tournament from from Bobby Fischer's perspective. Thank you all, and I'll see you soon.